Hi, I'm Dr. David Dobson. Welcome to Conversations. Today, my guest is Dr. Calvin Lakhand. Calvin is the co-director of Circular Innovation Hub at York University, advancing understanding of waste management research and policy in Canada. He holds a joint PhD from University of Waterloo and Wilfrid Laurier University. We will be discussing his research on sustainable packaging. It's a pleasure to have you on the show, Calvin. It's a pleasure to be here. What brought your interest to environmental and urban waste management? You know, so that's kind of a funny question. So I, I started my university career as a statistician and an economist. And so, um, you know, do, did my undergrad and we had a recruiter come in from environmental studies to see, you know, if people wanted to, you know, apply to graduate school. And at that juncture of my life, I realized, you know, all the theories and models I was doing is what we called, it's like, uh, you know, synthetic, like they weren't intended to be real world application. And I was right. becoming kind of disheartened. And so oh. when the opportunity came to study environmental studies, I said, you know, is there an opportunity to me, for me to bridge what I know about economics and math and join uh, that program? And that's kind of what got my foot in the door. And then later on in my professional life, my very first job was as a consultant for something called Stewardship Ontario. So for those who may not be familiar with what that is, they operate our province's residential recycling system. Okay. And I was blown away by how uh, large and complex and potentially contentious the world of waste was. Mm -hmm. And so I realized that as a consultant, you know, I had very limited latitude to pursue the questions that I wanted to pursue. Uh -huh. And so that was the impetus to going back to school to do my PhD with a specific examination of waste. And I haven't looked back in the past 10 years. So <laughs> you're having so much fun doing uh, some actual research. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> You, you are the co-director of the Circular Innovation Hub at the Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change at York University. Can you share some of the research that your lab is doing? Sure, absolutely. So we were originally called the Waste Wiki, like the Wikipedia of Waste, but then we realized not many people knew what that title meant. And so we had to change <laughs> our name. And so we kind of play in a lot of different areas, but like, you know, to, to keep, for the purposes of brevity, I would say, yeah. One component of what we do is a lot of consumer behavioral research, this idea of why do people do what they do and how can we encourage them to participate in yeah. socially sustainable initiatives. Yeah. Another part of what we do is uh, working on EPR regulation and legislation for our readers or our audience who may not be familiar with what that is. Yeah. Extended producer responsibility is kind of the new legislative push for having producers to be physically and financially responsible for managing waste at its end of life. And the other big project we're working on is uh, we're developing an open data standard for plastics in Canada. So um, Environment Climate Change Canada reached out to us and said, we need to have rules for, you know, how do we report data and how do we share data? And we were very fortunate to kind of uh, take the lead on that project. And uh, that's still ongoing. You recently conducted, conducted a research on sustainable packaging labeling. Can you share a little bit about this study? Yeah, absolutely. So um, as I'm sure you're aware of, there's a huge momentum by producers and manufacturers to communicate the environmental impacts of their products to consumers. Yeah. And the kind of the rationalization is that people now more than ever say they want to uh, make environmentally informed purchasing decisions and they would alter their purchasing habits to uh, buy more sustainable products. And so what we did was look at the efficacy of different sustainability uh, metrics and what do people understand versus what they don't understand. And also do people really want these things and are they willing to pay more for it? And what we found is that there's a significant disconnect between what people say they want to do versus what they actually do. So, yeah. um, you know, I'll try to explain this as simply as possible, but when you stop somebody and ask them to self-reflect on are you willing to do X, Y, and Z for the environment? Almost unanimously, people are going to say, I would be willing to do that. I'd be willing to pay more money for that. Yeah. But in reality, when you're actually like doing uh, time and motion research and doing direct observational research, yeah. people are unwilling. Purchases are largely habitual in nature. And so yeah. they're not really thinking about the environment or broader drivers for why they do what they do. Yeah. And so our research kind of explored that gap between values and intentions 
And I would say our biggest finding that we identified is that most people have zero idea for what the terms that that we use in sustainability. So when we talk about carbon or diversion or zero waste and circularity, all of these things are we're very familiar with as being sustainability professionals. The average person has virtually no understanding. And so I think that the key takeaway from our report was that um, producers and intentions are in the right place. Yeah. but their execution is very poor and it's not mm. going to resonate with consumers the way they want. Yeah. Is it something sound like a carbon pricing right now here in Canada? Like perhaps the intention is good, but most people don't know what this is all about. And perhaps the government not able to explain how, what carbon pricing can do for people. And that's the reason why there's a lot of pushback going on right now in many provinces in Canada. Any, any thoughts being economists? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, you made a big, a good point about it's well intentioned, but it's yeah. execution has been reprehensible. Yeah. Um, you have to be able to communicate to people what it is they're spending their money on. Why should we? Yeah. Take some take money out of our own individual pockets to help a collective good. Yeah. And I think the governments really fail to communicate. Well, what is this money being spent on, and how that's mm -hmm. beneficial to everybody, uh, both in the immediate term and in the long term. And so I think that, uh, and this applies to like eco-modulated fees as well. I remember when uh, waste electronics EPR fees came out, um, people were very upset. Why am I paying an extra $20 for a television? Yeah. Because we're not explaining to them, well, this is, this is to keep things out of landfill or this is to preserve yeah. or uh, reduce carbon. And so I think that communicating those messages are extremely challenging and just telling people it will be better for you is not... Um, compelling enough or persuasive enough yeah. for people to really get on board with that idea. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you for your thought on this. Let's let's come back to your uh, sustainable packaging research. So, what did you learn from that study? So, like I said, the the, the key takeaway is that um, there's a disconnect between how manufacturers communicate with yeah. what resonates with the audience, and to kind of elaborate a little bit more on that is that a lot of sustainable packaging is now using what we call smart labeling technology, where you scan the RFID yeah. or scan a QR code and it gets this all this wonderful information. Yeah. And what we discovered is that virtually nobody stops in the store to pull out their phone to scan a package, right? Yeah, 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 and yeah. Uh, to make it doubly worse is that um, we actually tend to create what we call tiered systems where mm -hmm. the people who are informed enough to potentially use it. We're assuming yeah. that they're native English speakers. We're assuming yeah. that they're tech savvy. We're yeah. assuming they have access to smart technology yeah. and um, it can potentially alienate a significant number of consumers. And that's actually what our research showed is that yeah. a lot of people don't have, at least in Ontario and the greater Toronto area, which is very diverse, yeah. they don't necessarily have the technical or language proficiency yeah. to fully utilize the tool and there's no translation function. Yeah. So uh, people feel like they're being left out. And I yeah. think that's an important part of the conversation mm. uh, that we can't neglect. Mm. I also wonder about even, even packaging, they have a different sign for recycle sign. I wonder really how many people really know what those signs mean and which, which plastic goes to which bag or which garbage goes to which bin. So I think there's a lot of uh, information's not clear, perhaps clear to many consumers when they try to so, dispose there. <laughs> if you allow me, I want to share a kind yeah. of a funny story. I, I hope you can see this, but on the inside, oh, I can't really show it. On the insides yeah. of my wrist are the recycling logo tattoos. Oh, you do have that? <laughs> wow. Yeah. So on the inner part of my wrist, it was <laughs> intended to show my commitment to sustainability and recycling. Nice. And then my own research showed that 60% of first generation Canadians yeah. Yeah. had no idea what that symbol meant. Wow. So imagine the symbol that we assume to be universal for recycling. Yeah. So I'm from a country called Guyana in South America. It's very oh. small and also yeah. very limited formal waste management. Yeah. Nobody had ever seen the recycling logo in that context. So they had no idea hmm. what it meant when I put it on my body. And then worse yet, the city of Toronto would use that symbol very prominently in messaging and communication. Yes. And so 60% of first generation Canadians are like, what the hell is this? We have a clear communication problem. Yes. So I just thought that's a funny way to explain that, you know, yeah. what we assume is a norm is yeah. uh, definitely not for a lot of other people. Yeah. Yeah. So what are some practical implications of your research? I think, you know, 
I would, I would, I would hope that there's practical applications, <laughs> but I, I, I think uh, some of the key takeaways, at least when it comes to the, our yeah. consumer-based research, is yeah. that yeah. we can't consume, assume that consumers are a homogenous group with mm-hmm. the same intentions and the same yeah. drivers. Yeah. And I find that a lot of existing strategies kind of rely on what we call environmental altruism, saying you're doing it because yeah. it's good for the environment or it's yeah. good for future generations. Yeah. But consumers are a heterogeneous group. And so mm-hmm. what, our, what, what our research looks at is the role of race and ethnicity mm-hmm. in affecting these drivers. And so yeah. you might ask a South Asian person, yeah. why do they recycle? It's fundamentally different than why a Canadian person will recycle, which is yeah. different than a Filipino person. Yeah. And so I think uh, if we were to explain our contributions or practical application is uh-huh explaining to both legislatures and the uh, producers that yeah. don't assume your audience is the same and acts yeah. for the same reasons. Yeah. Uh, we have to be cognizant of uh, cultural sensitivities and drivers as well. Right. So that leads to my next question. So based on your research, what is your advice to policymakers and producers on how to message sustainability? You know, it's it's extraordinarily challenging because once yeah. the, the more granular you get in terms of engaging with specific yeah. groups, yeah. the cost, the administrative externalities go through the roof. Yeah. And so what we found uh, potentially successful. So mm-hmm. I should qualify this by saying these were uh, like very limited studies. So I can't say if it's universally true, yeah. but we found that partnering with religious institutions or cultural mm-hmm. institutions and have them communicate the message has been extraordinarily yeah. successful. And so I'll give you a very specific example. So in the city of Toronto, mm-hmm. once again, we're sorry, my dog is shaking himself in the background. <laughs> um, in the city of Toronto, we have an incredibly diverse population, different languages, yeah. you know, different um, religious affiliations, et cetera. Yeah. And we wanted to communicate okay, we want residents to do A, B, C, D, but we couldn't do it in the language that they wanted. We couldn't do it in a way that made sense to them. And so we went to the churches and the cultural institutions and said, here's the recipe. Can you come up, or sorry, here are the ingredients to the recipe. Can you come up with the recipe for engagement? And we found that that was enormously successful because these institutions, uh, religious, cultural, otherwise, they knew how to communicate to their audience. They knew how to do it in a way that was relevant and engaging for them. And so I think that that could potentially demonstrate a strategy that using this top-down approach of communication uh, might be uh, not as effective as working with, for lack of a better term, like middlemen, the people who are actually engaged in these communities and help them work with us so that we can get our message out there to the broadest number of people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I was wondering about like in terms of message sustainability. So there is a packaging issue, which is like how is message packaged, but it's also communicating to the consumers. You know what I mean? Like because I see in my own neighborhood that the people from city comes and and because people don't know uh, which 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 garbage goes to which bin and and a lot of time in terms of recycling, a lot of materials is not recycled because it has been you know. The wrong garbage put into the wrong bin and 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 turn out to be a waste a lot of waste so uh, good intention not necessarily turn out to be a a a, a good you know so so do you have a specific advice for different stakeholders here Uh, so there's a couple things on that is that one i think uh, obviously convenience is the most significant predictor of success and so we need to make things as convenient as possible for people yeah. We also need to have harmonized standards for what should go in the bin. So in this specific yeah. question of, you know, what should yeah. go in a recycling bin and what actually gets recycled. Yeah. You know, I live in Toronto, which might be very different than what is done in York region, which is right beside us, which is different than what's done in Peel region, which is right beside us. Yeah. And so it's difficult for consumers to understand the rules of the game when the rules keep on changing across mm-hmm. very uh limited jurisdiction so it's like literally your next town over might be doing something completely different so i think we need to make it um more universal and applicable and harmonized the second thing is also is that Mm. relying on the consumer to make the right choice has historically been not very successful Mm. we've complicated this matter even further because Yeah. yeah Our our systems of say ten to fifteen years ago were relatively simple. It was like newsprint, cardboard, aluminum, PET. 
But when you look at the types of packaging produced today, it's multi-laminate, lightweight plastics. Most Mm. people have no idea where these things go. And there's a disconnect between our infrastructure, which was designed for those simple materials and what's coming out onto the market today. So I think consumers want to feel good and they want to feel like they're doing the right thing. So they put all of these lightweight plastics in the bin without understanding that our infrastructure really isn't compatible for it. Mm. So I think we need to do a lot of investment on the back end to make these things possible. Because once again, educating consumers to differentiate between like a polystyrene uh, foam versus like, you know, a PET laminate, it's too much to ask of them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any advice for those who wish to do further research on this topic? You know, so waste isn't a sexy topic. And so uh, what was really fascinating to me is despite the fact that waste is such a massive issue and it's in Ontario, just our recycling program alone is $330 million a year. It's not very actively researched by um, mm. like academics because yeah. there's an assumption that it's working, yeah. it's out of sight, out of mind. And so what I would yeah. encourage people to do is, yeah. is kind of peel back that curtain and say, is our system working as intended? Yeah. And then what are those pain points that make it not as successful as we want it to be? And I think when, you know, especially academic researchers have diff- interest in engineering versus behavior, yeah. every single part of the waste system involves those components. So yeah. we can have engineers work on the deficiencies of our infrastructure. We can have yeah. people like me who are more social scientists yeah. work on kind of the drivers of what people want to do. And so I think there's so many opportunities for researchers to involve themselves in the waste space. It's just a matter of, once again, peeling behind that curtain and figuring out where does my material go? And, you know, what are the challenges associated with it? Yeah. So you're suggesting also a lot of like a multidisciplinary and cross across the different areas to collaborate in this type of projects. Absolutely. I don't think that a viable solution can be had without the participation of yeah. every facet of academia, yeah. because, you know, if somebody were to ask me, how do you design an efficient recycling yeah. facility? I would look yeah. at them blankly and like, I have no idea. I'm not an engineer. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so yeah. we need to involve, yeah. uh, it, it, it yeah. takes, it, uh, I'm trying to remember the expression. It takes a village to raise a child and it yeah. takes a large community to solve a problem. Yeah. Yeah. I think you, you're right. Because a lot of time I also think that it is also treated as like a silos. Okay, this is your department, you do sustainability and this is it. So this is your yeah. responsibility. So so there's perhaps not kind of a club, uh, cooperation goes on across different areas. For sure. So what is next for you, Calvin? Hopefully I'm still alive. <laughs> no, <laughs> you know, I'm not joking. Um, so what's next for me is to continue our work on extended producer responsibility legislation yeah and we're now kind of launching a program called language of sustainability and kind of helping producers uh through workshops understanding how do you Mm -hmm. communicate with people and how do you master that language once again understanding cultural nuance ethnic nuance um you know all of the different drivers for why people do what they do yeah um and then lastly you know you know i mentioned the open data standards so hopefully and this is something we didn't really get a chance to address yeah. Oh, yeah. The biggest it's, problem, yeah. the biggest yeah. problem in the waste sector is a lack of good data, hmm. right? And so yeah. sometimes we say, well, you know, our legislation is lacking. Well, our legislation is toothless yeah. because you can ask for the world, but unless yeah. the information is there to help guide your opinion, yeah. you know, it doesn't mean much. And so one of the things that we're hoping to achieve with the open data standard is improve the quality of data, improve data reporting. Because right now, I think if the average person knew just how little information we had when it comes to developing significant programs like single use plastic bans, et cetera, yeah. they, they, you know, in short would be appalled because it, we're, we're doing a lot of guessing yeah. and academics should not be guessing. Mm-hmm. We should mm-hmm. be making our decisions on sound data. And I think the data problem is the most pervasive issue mm-hmm. uh, in the waste management sector. Thank you for your time, Calvin, and all the best for the important work you do. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I've had such a great time. Thank you so much, Dr. Dobson.